In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the silver linings of this pandemic is that my sons who work in San Francisco are now teleworking and have been able to be here in Richmond throughout Advent. Having all three together has had us sharing memories of the season, including the annual Christmas pageant rehearsals they endured as children. All three have played shepherds, sheep, angels. One even played the angel Gabriel, but never did they play the role of Joseph or Mary. <laughs> for all the chaos of those childhood performances and the variety of characters, there was always something so straightforward about Mary. Kneeling on stage with her head covered in blue and eyes fixed on Gabriel's glittering halo, it didn't occur to me what the Annunciation must have cost her. Her decision to say yes to God seemed predictable to me. Her obedience, easy. However, at this point in my faith journey, and after years of Bible studies and seminary and just plain living, there is a lot about Mary that feels neither straightforward nor easy. Despite my familiarity with her story, the mother of Jesus strikes me as a woman whose yes raises as many questions as it answers. Part of the problem is that we have buried her under so many layers of theological interpretation and artistic imagination as beautiful as all of the stained glass windows and paintings and musical settings of the Magnificat truly are, Mary is nearly impossible to excavate. Some of us pray to her. Others call her Theotokos, mother of God. For some, she represents a troubling model of pious femininity always sinless, ever a virgin, always mother. For still others, she's a child prophet, a young girl who fearlessly announced the arrival of God's kingdom to earth. I would like the real Mary to please stand up because I have so many questions to ask her, when did you tell your parents that you were pregnant? Did you tell Joseph yourself? Or did the gossip mongers of Nazareth take care of that for you? Did anyone in the village believe you? After Gabriel departed, did you doubt his Visitation, question your sanity, fear for your life. The story of the Annunciation that we hear today from Luke's gospel is what the Bible actually gives us to answer these questions. In the sixth month, we are told, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. From this bullet point introduction follows a succinct account. The angel greets Mary, calls her God's favored one, and describes a plan for a miraculous conception. Mary expresses doubt. Gabriel explains in greater detail. Mary consents, 
and the angel departs. The thing that is so challenging about this story is what it doesn't say. Yes, we know that Mary was much perplexed and that she pondered Gabriel's greeting. We know from her question, how can this be since I am a virgin, that she recognized the bizarre nature of the angel's announcement. And we know from her last words to the angel that she agreed to God's plan. And yet there is so much of the story that the gospel writer leaves out. So this advent, during a time in our own lives in which so much is left out, I've been particularly drawn to three of the story's missing parts. The first is the gap between Gabriel's title for Mary, favored one, and the task he assigns her. Tradition tells us that Mary was probably 13 or 14 years old when the angel appeared to her. We know that in first century Jewish culture, a girl who became pregnant out of wedlock faced grave danger. At the very least, she became an object of widespread scorn. At the worst, she risked being stoned to death by the very villagers who raised her. To say yes to Gabriel was to give herself over to scandal and ostracism. It was to put everything, her reputation, her marriage, her very life on the line. Is this what it means to be favored by God? This disconnect in the Annunciation story suggests to me that God's favor might not be the exalted thing we'd like to think it is. We tend to equate God's favor, divine favor, with wealth, health, comfort, or ease. But Mary's favored status led her straight from scandal to danger to the trauma of her son's crucifixion. God's call required her to trust an inner vision that flew in the face of everything her community and her culture expected of her. As the years passed and her son's enemies multiplied, Mary's yes demanded a degree of courage that would be daunting to me as a mother. Simply put, it's no easy thing to be favored of God. Which leads me to the second missing part of the story that I've wrestled with. And that is the space between Mary's question, how can this be, and her consent. Let it be with me according to your word. What happened in between? In a poem inspired by Sandro Botticelli's beautiful painting of the Annunciation, the poet Andrew Hudgens notes how Mary's left hand is raised in the painting as if to say, stop, while the other reaches toward Gabriel. Even as her whole body pulls away, her head bows, acquiescing. Hudgens concludes that Botticelli, in his great pity, lets Mary refuse, accept, refuse, and think again. 
I like that. Because the danger we get into when we idealize Mary's consent is that we overlook her humanity and keep her story at arm's length from our own. I don't know about you, but I have trouble relating to a person who leaps headlong into obedience. However, I can relate to someone who struggles, whose yes is cautious, even ambivalent. I hope that some time did pass between Mary's calling and her consent. I hope that the angel Gabriel waited compassionately for her answer honoring all that was at stake in her freedom to accept or refuse him. So now to the last missing part, the last gap in the Annunciation story that I have wrestled with, particularly during this time of pandemic and prolonged uncertainty. And that is how the story ends. Then the angel departed from her. This is a gap in my own life with God that I both recognize and dread. The moment when the prayer ends, the vision recedes, the certainty wavers. It's the moment after the yes, when the mountaintop experience fades into memory and life in the valley begins. I wonder how different Mary's experience might have been if Gabriel had stuck around to erase her doubts and silence her critics. But he didn't. He departed, leaving the ongoing work of discernment and discipleship and seeking companionship to Mary. Her yes didn't signal the end of the questions. They had only begun. There's a contemporary Christian song, which you've probably heard, that asks Mary what she knew when she consented to Gabriel's request. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? We have no way of knowing what Mary knew. My guess is that like us, she knew just enough to get started. My guess is that the work of bearing God into the world involved endless questions, ceaseless discovery, and ongoing consent, just as it does today. My guess is that each trembling yes Mary whispered into God's heart changed the world, as does ours. Amen.